This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This is why the Nkunguma Pride is such a firm favourite. It's Kinky Tail. He just looks ready for a fight. This is still her territory. The Evoker boys are here to stay. Ooh. How insane was that? It is that time of the week once again. A very good afternoon to all of you and welcome to this episode of Safari Lives. Now, my name is Jamie and this afternoon on this blisteringly, blisteringly hot day, Dave is sweating behind the camera. And of course, it's time for us once again to talk about the amazing events of the past week. Now, every day, twice a day, whether we're here in South Africa on Juma Private Game Reserve or across in the Maasai Mara, in Kenya, we get to see all sorts of extraordinary things. But not everyone has six hours a day to spend watching the safari. Not everyone really is able to stay up right into the wee hours of the night if they're in the wrong time zone. And so this is our opportunity to tell you what's been going on. So without any further ado, let's go find out where our animals are and what they've been up to. A little bit of rain has started the transformation of the low felt from brown to green. Hasana kept us entertained, trying to keep his kill in the most uncomfortable tree in the world, while his father made short work of an Anyala in the centre of Juma. Hasana popped past to see if there were any scraps left for him, but later struck it lucky with two dry season victims. Little Klalamba spent a week on her own to the east, waiting for mum to return. The lion dynamics continue to have us scratching our heads in confusion. The evokers made a brief appearance on Juma before moving north, and the Nkuhumas have yet to shake their clingy male companions. In the Mara, we have continued to spend time with the sausage tree pride and their cubs are growing in leaps and bounds. Young cubs and pregnant females should mean that the pride will not be moving enormous distances, which should, in theory, make them a great deal easier to find than earlier this year. So over the course of the next two hours, we're going to expand on what it is we've just showed you, and I'm going to try and keep this hyena skull on my head for the entire duration of the two hours. Remember to send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. We're going to be talking all things hyenas, but since we're just outside the tent, we're not out right in the middle of the wild. Let's go across to Sydney so he can say hello. A very, very good afternoon and welcome to the beginning of the Safari Lives. I am Sydney Pumunani Mikosi and I'm traveling with Dave, who is my, with Craig, who is my camera operator. And for in case if you need our attention, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. You can also follow us on YouTube chat stream. My plan this afternoon is looking for the cats. Osana is what I'm looking for this afternoon. I was with him this morning and he just got disappeared somewhere around the quarantine. So this cat my it must be sleeping somewhere here in the gully. There's a little gully going down this uh, side. For the past couple of days, Osana has been in the gullies. And we saw him showing some of the interesting playing activities. So now let's see what Osana has been doing on the past few days. The little prince or the Prince of Acrobats gave us a really special display of his personality this week. Sometimes he was skillful, sometimes he was just funny to watch. 
Hosanna's playfulness really shone through, especially as he tried to move this skill left by his father. His desk really were not in a row as he tried to catch some goose snacks, even though he still had a meal in a tree nearby. It was almost if he was trying to play here rather than hunt. The geese have new goslings, and this adult was pretending to be injured in order to lure Hosan away from the young ones. Once again, Tingana and Hosan found themselves sharing a meal. This time, it was Tingana who did the kill of Enyala. When the father had eaten his fill, Osana, bored with eating perhaps, decided he would use his meal as a jungle gym. Then it was on to a dunk ball exercise. Rubbing against the heavy wood droppings and urine is the usual behavior Osana had us in giggles with his hilarious antics when he tested the elephant dunk. Many of the spiral horned antelopes have died from the effects of the long dry season and the predators like Hosanna have taken an advantage. This poor Nyala cow was obviously pregnant. Unfortunately for the leopard, his breakfast died beneath a spotted eagle owl's nest and the protective parents were very irritated with his presence. Osana ate so much this week that he even managed to share his meal with a hyena after which the extension of playing and eating became too much and he finally settled down. Hosanna had some great moments last week. The highlights, it was the elephant dung taste. <laughs> that was very funny when he tested the elephant dung. So, but there's something very interesting which took place when Hosanna was chasing the geese. If you saw that goo, when he was running away, he was doing the wing like this acting as if the wing is broken. That was done deliberately. It is a behavior which is called a destructive behavior. A destructive behavior is done in order to make the predator to lose focus instead of going to the chicks or to the to the to the to the small ones the predator must then come to the uh, 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 to the adults who is not injured who is just pretending to be injured and then fly away and that is what the, that egyptian gi did to hosanna he was chasing the they was going towards the direction of the uh, gooselings and you saw that one pretended and then his attention then came to the adults as if the adult was an easy meal that is how the geese manage uh, to mislead our son to protect the little ones. That was interesting. <laughs> Francesca, indeed, Hosara is one of those. <laughs> he should be called the clown. <laughs> So maybe I'll find him somewhere here in this drainage this afternoon. He must be somewhere here. So I saw that the tracks came down towards this drainage line. Maybe he's got another little cave here, because yesterday afternoon he was on his little cave. So by these gullies, it's not that very hot. 
So I felt that. So now uh, let's go to Jamie, who is very interested on the hyenas. I am very, very interested with the hyenas. So interested, in fact, that we have a lot of stories to tell you this afternoon. So now it comes time to tell you what the plan is. And this is called hubris, by the way, and it's going to end in regret. But I'll tell you what the plan is for this afternoon. Now that I'm back and I've got a firm handle on what's going on with the hyena dynamics, we've prepared some clips and we're focusing in particular on the females of the clans. So we only really know of five five females that we're seeing regularly at the moment, plus a sixth who doesn't quite count because she's not quite there yet. She hasn't fully blossomed into the sort of the prime of her adulthood. But what we really want to show you is some of the ways in which you can identify the hyenas that we're talking about. Because for some of you, hyenas are your obsession. You love them as much as I love them. And in fact, if you could walk around like this all day, you absolutely would. But you can't, so you focused on looking at the spots of the hyenas and to them to you the hyenas are individuals but for a lot of our new viewers it really i mean like as the sighting that we had at the den the other morning it's absolute chaos and to try and keep track of the hyenas is about as difficult as trying to keep my head still at this point but good posture is very very important to us here on safari live so you know this is something that we're going to going to be very focused on right I'm going to really focus now. Let's get a little bit of an introduction to the ladies of the Juma clan. So this was a sighting that Sydney had on the 27th of August of this year. And I went through the footage and it just appealed to me so much because it's a really lovely example of the behavior between the various females of the clan. That's June over there. She's got Ntima by the leg. She's now going to drag her around upside down, which is so funny because that's exactly what we saw Ntima doing to Corky's cub the other morning. Then they went for a swim. Now here's what the really nice thing is is about this whole sighting was that it actually had five out of the six females that I want to talk about today. Ribbon was there, Pretty was there, oh, no sorry, Pretty was the one who wasn't there. Ribbon's there, that is Ribbon and June ganging up on poor little Intima and seeming, seeming to sort of try and drag her around the water. And then Hart comes in just to see what's happening. Now. Just ignore the male in the back. It's not that we don't want to talk about him, but we're not going to talk about him today. So you can ignore him. He's as out of this as he was that morning. So all four of these females, now watch Hart play with Intima. It's just such a touching sighting. <clears throat> we don't think of hyenas as animals that really play. But here they are gambling around, and it was really lovely to see a peaceful interaction Oh, he goes hot. Go, 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 go. Oh, look. Oh, oh. Falls over a pile of elephant dung. Now she goes dashing back. Do you know how hard it is to get a good screenshot of heart? She doesn't sit still. Oh, barreling past. Now we're going to fall over Corky, which seems like a terrible idea, but in fact did not result in any kind of disciplining from the matriarch because it was it was just that it was playfulness so what we're going to do for this particular safari lives and i couldn't do it i tried i didn't even make it through my first segment i, I said to dave i was going to do it for the entire two hours i couldn't so what we're going to do for the course of the safari lives is we're going to take each and every single female that we see regularly in turn i have prepared some diagrams but you're not allowed to see them too quickly okay we're going to have a quick look I've prepared some diagrams, see if you can guess who that is, those of you who know what we're doing. And we're going to go through each and every single one in turn. We're going to talk about Corky, Pretty, Ribbon and Tima, June and then Hart. And each and every single one has a rich history. I've gone right back to 2015. So there is plenty to tell you about. And hopefully after this, some of you who don't know our hyenas that well can walk away being able to recognize at least the females because they are really the core of this clan. And at this point, with the clan being as small as it is, they are the most important part of it. The survival of these cubs means the survival of the Juma clan, and it's essential over the course of the next few months. 
<laughs> Michael, you say all things hyena that you love it already. I'm looking forward to this. I'm actually really excited. I can't wait to show you some of the footage that we've dug up from the bowels of our archives. I'm very excited because some of these hyenas we've known since they were tiny, tiny cubs. Don't worry about the males. We'll get to them. We'll have to. You'll have to wait until I come back from leave. But we'll get to the hyena males of the Juma clan. But sadly, for now, they're going to be neglected, as male hyenas so often are. Right, we're going to head across to Mr. Hendry and the Masai Mara. He hasn't said hello to you yet, and I'm sure that he is absolutely dying to do so. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this end of Safari Lives. For this week, we are in the Masai Mara, of course, and this is the Sausage Tree Pride that we, well, it is, f it's five members of them here, two of the youngest and three lionesses. I don't know where the two very small ones are. I think these are the two slightly older ones. Yes, they are. One little lioness and one little male. Now talk to us, remember, hashtag Safari Live. And remember, we do want to talk about our characters during the course of Safari Live. And so we'll be talking about the Sausage Tree Pride and the North Clan of Hyena during the course of this episode. Well, that's from this end of the world. Now there are two of the cubs, they are the two slightly older ones, probably pushing about ten weeks now, and of course there are another two little ones. We met the sausage cubs again for the first time in a little while. The two smallest, probably about six weeks old, are now confirmed as male. I remain more convinced than ever that lion cubs are the most adorable creatures in all the wilderness, although I imagine parenting them must be something of a trial. If I'm not much mistaken, Kinky Tail could also be pregnant, as is one of the other lionesses, so we could have a whole string of chipolatas to look forward to. The older two are now about three months old. They are patient with their smaller cousins, possibly as a result of the latest in lion cub disciplinary techniques. This method is known as the pancake or flat Stanley. Very sweet, obviously. Very nice to see them there. And I'm glad to see that the cub that was sort of thumped down in that particular clip uh, seems to be now suckling very satisfactorily. It wasn't squashed. Now, while we've been sitting here, the Sausage Tree Pride has been doing some unusual stuff. When we got here, there were three groups. Were there? One, two, three. Yes, three groups. One with a lioness and two cubs. One with... Oh, I was right, actually, so this is quite interesting. Not this lioness. So another lioness with, I think, these two cubs. And then... A group of males with kinky tail, they're just beyond us there, two big male lions underneath that tree. There they are. And then under a tree to the left, there was another group of, I think, two lionesses under that tree there. Now, the original lioness we found, as we got here, immediately headed towards these huge herds of wildebeest. They've come back into the Mara, out of the Serengeti. There are tens of thousands of them all around us now. And so that's hugely exciting and hugely good prospects for this afternoon and for this evening. So the lioness we found, very heavy-bellied, I'm convinced she's pregnant, headed straight off towards them. She didn't manage to single out any oddly injured or sick ones. And so they, she and a friend, kind of just beyond the tree there. So they're sitting over there. So we still have three groups of lions now. Two over there, two males under the tree, and of course this beautiful group of three lionesses and the two cubs. So that's what's going on here. Just to reiterate, this herd of wildebeest, uh, or this mega herd of wildebeest, has reappeared from the Serengeti over the last little while. It's very, very exciting indeed. And so hopefully we will A, see the other two members of the Pride fairly soon, the two very little ones, 
and perhaps we might even get our very favourite sausage tree pride actually on the hunt. Oh, Rosalind, they won't be full grown the male until he's eight, believe it or not. He'll be mature and he will hopefully have taken a territory before then, but he'll reach his maximum mass when he's about eight years old. Female, probably at about four. And just like with human beings, of course, the ladies mature so much more quickly than the males. We are very, very lucky to be sitting here with these lions. It's tremendously special. No one else around. Of course, the Masai Mara is going through a very quiet time at the moment because the wildebeest is supposed to be gone and everything's supposed to be quiet here. Right, that's the mother. That's definitely the mother that's just but there's the other two little cubs. She's definitely lactating. Who's on camera? The evil eye. Let's go back to Brent Leo Smith, who has got another cat. Look at this. You can just see this cat slinking away. And he's going to lie down, I think, in the shade there. But I'm talking very, very quietly because this is a very, very unrelaxed leopard. I think it's Kojima, but that's very exciting. I haven't seen that leopard in over two years. I'm Brent Leo Smith, I have Sebastian on camera, and we've got to be very quiet and move very slowly. Kojima has made a kill right in the corner of Juma, and during the day he's not, not relaxed at all. As you can see, he's been slinking away from us. So his kill is up in the tree, he's caught an adult impala, in a marula tree. Can you still see him, Seb? He's a little bit to the right and they went into some shade. But you can see how he was moving there. A very, very unrelaxed leopard. Pretty sure it's Kojima. And this is Kojima's part of the world. You might be able to get the kill up in the marula tree there, Seb. You can just maybe see it through the, the gap there. Looks like an adult impala. Now, as it gets darker, he will become more relaxed. He's actually not too bad in the dark. It's just during the day where he's... Oh dear, am I just in the wrong spot? Because I can see it from where I am. It's just behind there. <laughs> okay, I don't want to move the car too much there. Let's just go backwards very quietly. Um, as I say, we don't want to put too much pressure on him. We want to be very, very, very calm and considered in our movements. You can see I'm driving very, very slowly. And for me, it is one of the great joys being able to work with an unhabituated leopard like this. And it's very tricky and you can get it wrong very easily and that can really make that leopard skittish for the rest of its life. And unfortunately, we just don't see Gajima enough to work on him, but the last time we had him on a kill was very close to this area, and I was able to eventually, after two days, even have good visuals of him during the day. But it takes a lot of patience and and, and a lot of a lot of quiet talking. <laughs> Gremlins is wondering what does Gajima mean? Gajima means run away and that's because that's what he does. So I'm, and I'm gonna move back up onto the eastern boundary. We might be able to get a long distance visual, but look, I'm still in low range. I'm moving very, very quietly, very, very slowly, so to not disturb him. And it's very exciting to, to actually be with a leopard like this. And it's not the type of leopard we see too often. If you take his behavior compared to Hosanna, we saw a little bit of similar behavior from Tingana when he spotted the bushwalk this morning. But as soon as he's with the car, he's completely relaxed. But you can see here that this leopard is very unrelaxed. And that's because I see he's not found often and a lot of the areas he lives in, sort of this we, uh, northern side of Torchwood and into Buffalshock, sometimes people don't drive there for weeks at a time. So unlike Juma where we drive every day, he doesn't spend that much time on Juma. But what he, he does do, he comes in towards around Buffalshock Dam and this, this corner here. 
Okay, I'm going to just slowly move along to see if I can get one last, well, not one last sight, but a sight of him, and then I'm going to find a little shady spot nearby, and I'm just going to sit and wait it out to see if he makes another appearance, and maybe as it gets darker, he might come out into the open towards his kill. But in the meantime, let's go back to Jamie, who's talking about Corky, the matriarch of Juma. I am indeed. Now, if anyone can habituate the leopard, I'm sure that Brent can. He might need more than just one episode of Safari Lives, though. Now, I've just been sitting examining my fingerprint underneath the microscope, just having a look at the different ridges and lines and actually marvelling at the number of calluses I have on my dry finger. It's uh, terribly awkward. There you go, that's my fingerprint there. It looks horrendous. My goodness, I need some moisturizing cream. But on a completely different topic, why am I talking about fingerprints? For our new viewers, each and every single hyena has a unique pattern of spots, as unique as the ridges on your fingertips or my fingertips. Every single person is different. Every single hyena is different. Now, where to start when talking about the Juma clan members? Well, there is no better way than to start talking about the top the top level, Corky the Matriarch. Have a look at Corky from 2015. That's her over there. Look at her ear and look at the bite marks. Now that was when I think she at least opened up that tear on her left ear, which is such a defining feature of this particular hyena. So this is her when she had D1 and D2 at the Mvubu Road hyena den. This is her now returning triumphant to her den after the brutal Voca male attack, which of course will probably leave a scar, which I think will have disappeared very, very shortly. There's a lovely close-up of her torn left ear. Now, Corky's a tricky one. Actually, no, let's rephrase that. A corky is a very easy one. That ear is really all you need to see to know that you're looking at her, and that the spot patterns really become irrelevant when you are dealing with an ear just like that. But let's start basic. She is so easy to identify. So this has taken me a considerable period of time, but this is what I've been drawing up for each and every single hyena. So I haven't done the males yet, I haven't got around to the males, but th what I've done is essentially highlighted the spots that to me stand out. Now typically I tend to look at the patterns on the shoulder of the hyena, but really for Corky you don't need to bother too much about that. One thing I have noticed about her is that she has a very spotty belly. So whenever you see her suckling, you can actually see the spots extending all the way down right across her belly in a way that you don't see with a lot of other hyenas. She's also, I find, quite greyish in colour, although she is getting older. She's getting on. She was born in 2009, if I'm not mistaken. And then most importantly, that there. That notch out of her left ear. Remember, you're seeing the image mirrored. So that is Corky over there. And then a little flap, which I've overemphasized. It looks a bit ridiculous. A sort of a little, uh, I don't know how to phrase it, a dangly bit? She's got a little dangly bit out of her left ear. There we go. So that is Corky. Now, I was going to say maybe we go back and have a look at her, but I think that Corky's probably the easiest of the hyenas to identify. Now, when, way back in 2015, the way that she behaved was quite submissive, certainly towards Madame, which would have made sense as she was the matriarch. But I was watching the footage and I noticed a little bit of vying for dominance with Pretty. And one day when we really go into it, I'll show you that footage and we can have a look at it. But for now, it suffice for you, or it's sufficient for you to know that that is the top member of the clan. She is the head of the hierarchy and every single other hyena falls below her. We don't know which hyenas are related to Corky or which hyenas are related to each other. Not if we go back further than around about four or five years. 
So we actually don't fully know what the, the level of connectedness is between the various females. All that we know is that they, we have to sort of spend time getting to know their dynamics and look at the way that they slot in below Corky. There's one female I haven't included on this list and that is her daughter D1. December 1 was one of the little cubs that were wandering around at the beginning of that clip in 2015. There we go. Dory, you want to know if we ever see D1 and D2? I believe the last time they were seen was in 2017. We're now almost at the end of 2018. That doesn't necessarily mean that D1 isn't around, or indeed D2, because I think it's still a little bit... Oh no, three years old would be about right for D2 as a male to disperse, but D1 we honestly haven't seen for a very long time which is why she's not been included on this list. If she shows up, then of course we'll go back into it because then we have a really lovely continuation of the female line of Corky and her descendants. And as well as that, because Corky's current cub is thought to be a male, she actually has no descendants, or female descendants to take over from her if she gets a little bit too old to rule the clan, unless D1 shows up and puts her little nose back into the picture. So I haven't included a D1 on that list. For those of you that are new to the hyenas, don't panic. Put D1 on a shelf for now. Put it, put it on a shelf, uh, which I have done with, with the, the shelf behind me. I decided it had a far too masculine touch to it. And so, with all those skulls, we, we've thrown in some greenery. Some admittedly quite comic, but there you go. Right, let us head across to Sydney, who of course was witness to the moment that a corky was attacked by the lion. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. I've got a surprise here under the shade. You can see he is now yawning. We have just managed to come across the lovely little chief Hosanna who is just now under the tree here. So it's time for him to rest at the moment. So a few weeks ago, I was on a, I was on a, a sighting by the hyena den when one of the big males arrived there in order to take away the food from Koki and the rest of the clan. And suddenly, Koki decided to go away after a very strong attack by this very big male. And let's see how Koki returned back after being chased away by the big male lion. There was a collective sigh of relief from across the globe as Corky returned to the den site. She looked a touch on the thin side, for hyena that is, perhaps a little wary, and the wound below her shoulder will probably bother her for a while. But all in all, she looked better than any of us could ever have hoped for after being used as a male lion chew toy. Her cub was happy to see mum and greeted her briefly but seemed more interested in coming to say hello to us. Though impossible to say for certain, I think it's safe to assume that this was not Corky's first time back at the den since the Avoca incident. Once Corky was convinced that there weren't any lions hiding behind the bushes, she settled down and allowed her cub a meal of some of the most nutritious milk in the animal kingdom. Further to the northwest, Hart and her band of boys devoured yet another waterbuck. This portion of the Juma clan seems to have discovered that chasing prey into the sticky mud of a drying waterhole is an easy way of securing food. The males bickered over the scraps, giving us a rare insight into their unique dynamics. Fascinating though their hunting habits may be, it was the tale of the resilient mother and matriarch that dominated our thoughts. I was so very sad and worried when uh, Koki disappeared after the attack by the big lion, considering the fact that Koki had a little one. But now that Koki is back, I am so very happy that the little one is going to survive. So you can see that now, uh, under this very big marula tree, uh, Hosanna is resting at the moment. There has been some kudus here 
and he was not even interested on them. I think they were too big for him because those kudus were already fully grown and it was just a group of females. So this cat is very much interested on play these days. Yesterday I also saw him again playing and this morning he was also playing again. So he's getting bored these days. So this area where we are by the quarantine, there is quite a lot of short grass. The chances of this cat to take down an animal such as the impala are very much high, as impalas these days, they are preferring to feed here by this big open space. There is quite a lot of small green trees recovering the leaves at the moment, attracting those kind of animals to come here. He looks very tired. You can see that... Uh, <laughs> Roshni, uh, Tingana is still my favorite cat, but uh, now definitely my interest is stolen a little bit by Hosanna at the moment. Look at that. Hosanna is cute and is growing very nicely. This cat looks so healthy. It's well fed. Now I can see he's now starting to become active. He might now maybe go to the Galago pen. He's just aligning himself with the shade from the tree. Marula trees are starting to bring back the leaves and the fruits at the same time. Both leaves and fruits are coming back at the same time at the moment. So he's providing her, him with uh, a lot of shade at the moment. So it's time for grooming now. So cats normally before they wake up, they're so very clean and they must have to groom themselves because uh, Hosanna is solitary. He's gonna have to do grooming by himself. But most of the cats who are staying in pride, such as the lions, you will see them grooming each other. So grooming can be reciprocal. What is he watching? that side. I'm trying to check there, but I'm not seeing anything. So now let's go back to Brand, who is now driving around. Yes, we've decided to leave Gajima. We got a good glimpse of him and I don't want to stress him out during the day. And of course it is safari lines and I've got to try find a character. So there was a report of lion tracks somewhere on this road. Um, it could have been Gwari Pan, I'm not 100% sure. We'll go check there now because I'm not seeing any tracks here. But I'm not sure. Uh, I got a report from my brother that they had only f uh, four Inkumas and the one Talamati male on Little Gari this morning. Which means the Vokas might have chased them. So. It could easily be, well it says there were tracks of two, so it could easily be some of the missing ones if they were bombshell, bombshelled by some nasty evoker boys. Okay, so while I scan the ground for these lion tracks and maybe take a little stroll into the block, let's go see what the Nkormas have been up to this week. The Talamati male is reaching sexual maturity. Although he hasn't quite figured out exactly what's happening just yet. Amber Eyes seems to be coming into Estrus as well as one of the sub-adults. All three together causing some confusing times. However, this doesn't seem to be affecting the dynamics of the pride. It, however, might attract the attention of the Avoca males, which would spell disaster for all the young boys hanging about with the Inkahumas. The Menji Mangen males still haven't been fully accepted into the pride and are often seen lying a short distance from the rest or following slowly behind.
as lions do, they spent the heat of the day lazing in the shade of the riverine thickets on the edge of the Mawati River. They merged into the night and headed to the east. They soon began stalking waterback in Impala. The over-eagerness of the unwelcome Mangen males ruined the hunt and we left them hungry and hoping for success later in the evening. Welcome back. So, lots of shenanigans. How strange was that little, um, well, threesome for lack of a better word. Now this is where the last lion tracks apparently cut west into this little river system. Now uh, we're not sure, I haven't seen a clear one yet because obviously someone else has driven. I'm just looking, I can see half a track there. Uh, there's no water at Quarry Pan. The closest water is Buffalo Dam. But I've checked there already. So that means they are probably having a heavy snooze somewhere in one of these thickets here. And it is quite thick in here. Yes, it is a, it's not a good line to be a Mangani male. Times are tough. I'm still not convinced that all three of them are going to make it. So one, uh, one will definitely make it, but two, I'm still not 100% convinced that all of them will make it. But hopefully they do. I'm just keeping a very close eye in here. Might be worth taking a little stroll into the river here. You can see someone stopped and reversed and had a look around here. So this is obviously the spot where the tracks disappeared. Okay, well I'm going to go a little bit further down and walk up the river system from the bottom in case they've walked further. Uh, while I do that, let's go see what Jamie has to say about the hyena named Pretty. <clears throat> I have lots of things to say about the hyena named Pretty. First of all, best name ever because she is a truly, truly attractive female. Secondly, she comes with a fascinating story. If indeed she is the daughter of the previous matriarch, Madam, she's seen something of a fall from grace over the last few months. So in theory, she should have inherited the title of matriarch. She hasn't. Corky has that title. So it's been interesting to watch them because the two of them, while Corky's definitely dominant, they actually have something of a friendship, in my opinion, from what I've seen in the way that they interact with each other. I actually think they quite like each other. They're not quite as close as Corky and Ribbon are, to my mind, knowing or seeing just from observation, but they are very, very close, and they seem to have that synchronized cycle where they've both had cubs at exactly the same or almost exactly the same time for the past two litters. I know that Pretty had a previous litter, between the her between November and now and November I'm not talking about the month November I'm talking about the cub November it gets a little bit confusing let's not overcomplicate things let's go and meet our second female of the Juma clan whose name is pretty I had to give you this shot from 2015 just because I think it epitomizes the joy of being a hyena. <laughs> this is Pretty at the Mvubu Road Hyena Den and I think she's absolutely hilarious. All right, a pause there for me, Megs. So, at some point, or, or in 2015, Pretty had these beautifully intact ears. She doesn't anymore. She also has a massive scar across her right cheek. That will probably disappear. But just have a quick look at this, if I can show you, um, before we go into looking at the side profile of Pretty. There's something that stands out apart from the notches of her ears, and that is the arches of spots across her shoulders. Now, what I'm showing you is my way of recognizing the hyenas. So let's say Pretty's ear, you couldn't see it on this particular occasion. Have a look at the curves around her shoulders, both on the left and the right hand shoulder. She's got this sort of beautiful curve of spots. 
And then, of course, on her left-hand side, she's got three that run up towards her neck. The biggest giveaway is that ear. So the ear notch over there, you can't really miss it. That looks nothing like Corky, but I never claimed to be an artist, and I traced these anyway. I, I didn't draw these freehand. I'm not going to claim any credit for that. I would love to. <laughs> okay, so have a look now, pretty. So there we go. There's that scar across her cheek. I haven't drawn that in because I don't think that you really need that. But that thing across her ear, there you go. Look at the arch over her left-hand shoulder. Perfect. See? See how those spots go? There's three that start at right at the front of the joint of her neck and then it arches back over towards the rest of her. Now, she's a very spotty hyena. Some hyenas are less, less spotty than others and I'm talking about spotted hyenas, but she's a very spotted hyena, so if you're looking for clues, look at that arch across her shoulder. All right, and that's on both the left-hand side and the right-hand side. She's got that beautiful arch. And there she is, proud mother of two little raisins. For surely they are raisins, those cubs. They really, that's exactly what they look like. The one in particular was very pruny. They obviously are no longer pruny, and what's fascinating is I've noticed, and I think some of you have as well, one of her cubs has got an arch of spots over its shoulder. Now, I have absolutely no proof of this, and I have never managed to find a scientific article that shows this, but I believe that you can actually see which hyenas you can't exactly confirm it, but you can take a guess and say that hyena looks like it might be related to that hyena. Because I found that where I have known the family connection, I can see the similarities in the way in which their spots are patterned and the, the number of spots they have, the color of their fur, whether they're very spotty, whether they aren't very spotty, but they're very spotty legs, all sorts of things like that I find tend to be genetic and I've noticed it. And I think that one of Pretty's cubs has got that beautiful little arch of spots on her shoulder. So you can ignore all the other spots. You don't have to learn any of them. How cool is that? <laughs> Ooh. James, you want to know what the theories are as to why the Juma clan is so small? There's a couple. There's one theory that I've spoken about with some of the other guides is that we actually only see a portion of it and that there's more of them towards the Torchwood side and Koro side, Kruger or Manuleti. I don't necessarily buy that. I really feel with the amount of time that we've spent at a den site, we would have an idea of of the individuals that come and visit. So I really don't think there are more than we think there are, or at least that we see regularly. There might be one or two, but not enough to really account for the size of the clan. I think something happened with the loss of Madam. I think that or, uh, the Juma clan was always quite a small clan. Maybe something happened, a spread of a disease, or maybe they were a split from a larger clan at some point and took time to increase in numbers. Then Madam died last year. Gwen and Scarback went shortly after. All three were very old hyenas. I mean, Madam, if you looked at her, she, she'd been through the wars. She really had. Corky's starting to get the same look. It's not an easy life being a hyena. And maybe it's just taken them some time to build up the numbers. And sometimes what happens is you get too many males born, especially with high-ranked females. They often give birth to... Or sorry, with low-ranked females, they often give birth to males. I don't know why that would explain... The size of the clan, just perhaps a lot of them disappeared and dispersed off. Actually, there's a thought. What happens if it was a split of low-ranked females from another clan? Now, typically, low-ranked females tend to, not always, they tend to average uh, out having more boys than girls. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe they're low-ranked. That hasn't quite stabilized yet and they had a lot of males and the males dispersed. I don't know. I'm really just spitballing ideas here. I've, I have no better idea than you do. I quite like that theory, though. <laughs> Mr. Nom, you want to know who the high-ranking male is in the clan? I confess I haven't spent enough time closely, closely watching the males. I can tell you that Tsaka is very popular with the females. That doesn't make him the uh, the highest ranking. Um, I know that Comet's been around for a very long time, so I don't know if Comet is somehow further up there. Oh, by the way, I'm talking about immigrant males, because if Corky's cub is a male, that is the highest ranked male of the clan, full stop. 
But if we're talking about the immigrant males who fall in right below the, the clan's hierarchy, I think Tsaka's quite high up there. Just by the way the females treat him doesn't necessarily mean he's high ranked, but he spends a lot of time with... I, I found him with Pretty the other day. It was quite lovely. They were sleeping together off in the bushes. Um, and then it would be Bella, if he was still around. I don't know where Bella's gone. I imagine that he's dispersed. That was Madam's son. It would be Corky's current little boy, November, would be quite high ranked. And D2 would also be very high ranked if he were still around. I don't think that he is. But all of those are males. All of those are natal clan males, meaning they will most likely disperse, but not necessarily. If they don't disperse, they retain their rank, and they basically give up quite a lot of mating options in order to stay in, within the clan, be very, very high ranked within it. I think. Yes. Paula, the lower ranked males do have a chance to rise within the clan. They can they can actually fight their way to the top, but that's quite unusual. Most of the time they stay at the bottom bullied until another male from the immigrant male line. So that think of them as separate to the natal clan males who will never ever lose their status unless they immigrate. From the immigrant males, if one dies or one actually decides it's got better options elsewhere, which doesn't really happen often, then every male shifts up a slot. Or if another male comes in, then obviously it goes to the bottom of the pile and that male is sort of psychologically and physically lifted up in the ranking. So he suddenly finally got someone to bully, which is going to make his life that much better because at least he's not right at the bottom of the pile. Although, as I've mentioned, studies show it's more stressful to be a mid-ranked hyena than it is to be a low-ranked hyena. Because you've got to remember everything. Just like I've got to remember all these names and James and the Maasai Mara has got to remember all of the dynamics of the different animals, whether it is the North Clan or the various Sausage Tree Pride members. Yes, we do have the lions. Thankfully, they seem to have sat up, and that is because the wind has started blowing off the Ullaloil escarpment straight into their noses, and of course it carries on it the smell of wildebeest and zebra and probably buffalo as well. Now, this chap is in... I've seen this once before, actually. I had a dog that had the same problem. This is a little bit like being able to rub your head and your stomach in opposite directions at the same time. He is unable to scratch his underarm without sticking his tongue out at the same time. That is ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> now this is one of the old Donyal Payek males, as far as I can make out. I'm going to say a male of around about six years old. And these are the fellows that have been mating with the Sausage Tree Pride. We think they have impregnated Kinky Tail. We think they've impregnated the very heavily bellied one that I think is must be about to give birth now. Now I bet all of you are thinking, oh, that's a big male lion. And I'm going to tell you that he's not that big, actually. He's actually relatively small, very beautiful, and interestingly has a darker mane than his cohort. There we go. I remember the two dominant male lions of Juma for a time, the Matimbas. One of them had a red head, a bit like the one on the right there, and the other had a much darker mane. It was called Hairy Belly. One was definitely more dominant over the other, which is unusual in a coalition. I'm not sure what the story is here. Incidentally, the Matimba males apparently are still alive, if you can believe it. For those of you who've been watching a long time, you'll know that there were two magnificent males who went into retirement, basically, at Londolozi. Uh, they didn't really have a territory, although females wandered through or past where they were for a time. They mated. I'm not sure if they sired any further cubs. And they're apparently still alive in the far west of the Starby Sands. Uh, they're not looking great, apparently. They've lost their manes just about entirely. But, you know, 
Some of us get bald when we get older. Now one of the lionesses moved off over here and I think she's going to fetch the little cub. So while we go and see if we can find them, let's go back to Sidders and the little chief in the shade. It's quite very hot at the moment, but Hosanna is not lying down. He's just now relaxed there, looking at that side. We have just seen one small daycare coming down the drainage. Maybe that is what is now having his attention. He doesn't want to lie down every time he's looking at the drainage. So we saw a daycare coming down. Maybe he might decide to go after the dega or not but at this stage the temperature is very high it's discouraging some hunting thinking on this cat so it's just that now in front of this cat is uh, densely populated it will be very easy for him to go down there if he just have interest of going after that uh, uh, little daycare. But now you can see he's lying down. As I indicated, the sun, I don't think, will support him to do this hunt unless the daycare come towards his direction. J.C. Charles, that is highly impossible. <laughs> so when it comes to the males, uh, it doesn't work. Males don't welcome any other males in their territory. Extension of the territories of the same sex to the males, they don't allow that. I'm sure that Wasana might be having a, a thought that uh, he might inherit the territory if anything happens to Tingana. But that I can promise you, there are, they are other males in the area such as uh, Okumori uh, who are always coming and going who can also challenge Wasana whenever uh, the opportunity arises to take over the throne for this area. So it's not going to be easy for Wasana to take over here and considering his experience that might also minimize the chances of winning the territory because those other ones such as Okumori they've been around for quite a long time they know the tricks they know they can fight. And at this stage, Osana is afraid of Hukumori like you won't believe. I was once on a sighting where Osana was chased by Hukumori some few months ago. So at this stage, this cat, you'll see him demarcating and spraying, but that is not meaning anything to the territorial holder, Hosanna. The thing is, when these animals are spraying the scent marks, scent marks has got quite a lot of vital information about the animal. Every time Hosanna marks, when Tingana comes there, just from sniffing, Tingana knows that Hosanna won't do anything. Animals don't judge each other only from the appearance. Yes, lions, they've got big manes which mostly exaggerate the size of an animal to scare the intruder. Uh, but here, by the lepers, no mane, nothing, not from the eyesight. It must have to be confirmed by the sense of smell if he's strong enough to challenge or not. So by the lions, both scent marks as well as the physical appearance counts in order to scare the intruder. So now let's go hear more stories about the hyena called Ruben. The hyena named Ribbon. Hosanna loves Ribbon and Tima. They seem to spend their lives tormenting poor Hosanna. It's actually quite, quite, in, it's sort of quite entertaining in its own way. Right. Now I'm just finishing the day call. That can go there. Perfect. Beautiful. Hanging plants. Everyone loves a hanging plant. I don't know why we've never thought of this before. Okay. Right, Dave is going to lower his camera and uh, get into the right position and we're going to talk about the lovely Ribbon and her daughter Intima. 
Look at this. All the way back from 2015, there's a young ribbon. At that point, we really thought she was a male. <laughs> she was thought to be a male. Um, and right up until 2017, when she surprised us all, look at little, little hyenas chasing ribbon around. She's sniffing about. This is now in 2017. That's Gwen, for those of you that remember Gwen. And this is when she proved to us all that she was not, in fact, male. That is a little intima suckling from Ribbon at this point. Now, unfortunately, its littermate, her littermate, did not survive. So Intima's other sibling didn't make it. It's something very unfortunate. Okay, and pause for me. Thank you. Right. Ribbon. Whew. Trying to draw spots on ribbon. You know how tricky that was? It was really, really tricky. So let me show you what I want you to look at and then we'll come back to the view. This is... Ah, no, I'm sorry. We need to keep going. My bad. Now that I'm looking against the glare, well spotted, Megs. Megs telling me that this isn't Tima, not Ribbon. She's absolutely right. That isn't Tima. So there's Tima now all grown up, and I've got a head of myself. <laughs> and Tima, of course, has been a truly attracted right. That's, this is what we need to look at. We need to look at Ribbon's ear. Ribbon had something of a facelift. So at one point, Ribbon's ears were beautifully clean. The outline was a totally crisp and clean and clear. Now, poor Ribbon does not have a crisp and clean ear. So there we go, that's Ribbon's now left ear. I'm sorry, I forgot where I meant to pause to look at Ribbon. It's okay, we've still got several other hyenas. Ribbon's ear has been mangled. I also find it very useful to look at her spots on her right hand side. I see a W. I see a W here. But of course other people might take that into account. I see a W and a sort of backwards L. I find it also very helpful to have reference spots, little dots. Then her left side, and I do have to mention this, this is why Ribbon was called Ribbon because of a ribbon-shaped set of spots that looks like um, a cancer awareness raising ribbon. I really feel as though I missed a trick not having a ribbon with me. So that is ribbon. You can take your screenshot. She's got a string of very dark spots on her left side. That's what I wanted to show you, but I completely messed that up. As well as a series of little dots moving away, making a sort of an arrow, and then a tiny set of little dots underneath that line of dark spots. But you really can't mistake Ribbon anywhere because quite frankly Ribbon these days looks as though she has suffered a life of tragic abuse because now she walks around like this at all any one point in time. Ribbon's got her ears down here. I don't know what happened to her in the middle of the year. She, well, I mean we know that she got attacked by the hyenas. We don't know which ones, we don't know how, we don't know exactly what happened and Tima seems perfectly comfortable in the presence of the other hyenas but Ribbon really walks around like a kicked puppy. She's got her ears right down here and she's got scars on the top of her head which look very very, looked as though they were very painful and of course now, the mangled ear. Now, I cannot see the preview well enough to actually double check, Meg, so let's let's risk it. Let's have a look and see. <laughs> there we go. That's Ribbon. That is she. That is her. That is when Ntima was still little. So Ribbon is not the hyena on the left. That is Gwen. Gwen, by the way, is a really good example of a hyena that um, has passed on the spots to her daughter. But look at the, the line, the, sort of the stripes of, or the strip of spots on Ribbon's side. You can see her really, really clearly. And then look at the tiny little spots that I was talking about underneath it. So while my diagram might, might not be 100% on point and accurate, it gives you a rough idea of what to look for. That and, of course, the mangled ears. That will be the dead giveaway that she didn't have at this point. The 30th of October 2017. 
ribbon was wandering around looking as though she was completely in charge of absolutely everything, except when it came to Gwen, who dominated her. Weird. Really, really strange. We don't quite know where ribbon fits in in all of this story. Bit confusing. B. Wilson, no. I can't say that I've noticed personality traits that have been inherited between mothers and cubs or offspring. And the reason that I, I, I'm relatively confident in saying that is because so much of a hyena's personality, as we think of it as their personality, is shaped by their upbringing. So the psychology of being either a low-ranked hyena or a high-ranked hyena. Obviously, they still have personalities. Something in Waffles of the North Clan snapped and she overthrew the previous matriarch and went from the bottom bottom to the top top which is completely unheard of so i don't know exactly what it is that made her do that but there's clearly personalities within them but i haven't noticed any kind pudding would be a really good example the adventures of the christmas pudding is her full name she's a hyena in the maasai mara her mother's clever girl one of the lowest ranked hyenas in the clan and pudding was just the happiest cub that ever existed. She bounced around, and even though she got bullied all the time, she was perfectly happy. So they do have their personalities, but it is shaped by their upbringing, and obviously under a, ben a benevolent matriarch, the adventures of the Christmas pudding, or pud, let's face it, we all called her pud, was quite a happy little creature. Right, let us jump on board with Brent, who hasn't managed to find the lions, I don't think, but I think he spotted a reptile for you. Indeed, we have. <laughs> Megan There's a either said. Blow cop copper munder. We were talking about strange Afrikaans names earlier today on the Sunrise Safari, but it's a blue headed. I don't know what a copper munder is, but in English it is just a tree and karma. Isn't that wonderful? Now, oh, and there he goes. Maybe we can get a better view of him without that harsh light as we go around. So, um, the lion tracks, I saw one track in the block, but I think they're quite old. So I'm not gonna waste too much time looking for them. I think those are from a couple of days ago. Oh, I can, there we go, I got him through there. There's a little gap. A little bit more forward. You can now see his lovely blue head. Where he gets that off a can't oh no. Uh -huh. There's sticks in our way everywhere. Let me try a reposition for you, Sebastian. No, I'm gonna go f round and forward, round the tree. Hopefully he doesn't run away too far, but we should be on the right side of the light now. Uh, hey, hey, he's going, we're playing round and round the leadwood tree. Round and round the leadwood tree. Round and round the leadwood tree. No, really, we're going around the Ledwood tree again. Yeah, now the light's bad. But it should get good as we come around the corner. Yeah, yeah. There we go. That's how you wrangle a blow copped copper munder. One of the bigger lizard species that we get here, of course, not including the two monitors. Now, females lack that bright blue head, so that's a boy, and he's got the bright blue head to, you know, woo the ladies. And if you look carefully at his feet, you can see those incredible claws that enables him to scamble, scramble straight up vertical tree trunks. The most minuscule, whoops, he's scattering around. The tiniest little gaps and crevices he's able to sink those long claws in. Oh, maybe he's hunting. I think he sees some dinner. Very cool looking lizard there. Oh, he's got an ant on him. Roshni says such beautiful colors. Indeed they are. And uh, look at that, that incredible blue to find in a reptile. Looks like he left a bit of lunch on his, on his bottom jaw there. 
doesn't like ants. The ant ran over him. He didn't want to eat that. Of course, they eat a whole various diff uh, load of different things, but mostly insects. But not ants. Well, not those ants. You can see them all running over him. Maybe that's why he was jumping and the ant bit him in the armpit. There we go. Very, very cool. Incredibly strong little creatures. They're about 10 or 15 centimeters in length. It's so not too small. But anyway, as I was saying, <laughs> we, we didn't have any luck with those lines. I don't think the tracks are that fresh. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to go find some elephants. But I have been very lucky this week because I've managed to spend some time with my favorite animal, albeit it was a lonely twosome wooing their way through the week. I was lucky enough to spend time with two lonely male wild dogs, whose original pack was decimated by canine distemper. Their lonely calls echoing through the dry bush vault as they search for dispersal females to form a new pack. So intent on their search for females, they completely ignore hunting opportunities. I really hope these boys are lucky in love soon. Oh, 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 oh. Shame, boys, looking for love. Yes, I really do hope that those dogs find some dispersal females and form a new pack and come live on Juba and have a den here. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Next year, of course, they gotta find the ladies first. They know wild dogs normally only den uh, in about May, June, during the dry season. But it would be wonderful to have a den on Juma or Torchwood or Chitwa. It would be very exciting. Would the cars be able to keep up? That's the problem, I think. But yeah, so unfortunately those two boys are from the lower Sabi pack originally, uh, which was a very big pack, close on 30 dogs, and uh, they got decimated by a horrible disease called canine distemper. Now, wild dogs get it from domestic dogs, and uh, it being such a highly social animal, with all their greetings rolled around, nipping and licking on the faces and regurgitating food for each other, uh, a highly contagious disease like distemper spreads through a pack very, very quickly. Now, so unfortunately those are, I think, if I remember correctly, the only survivors. There might have been one female who survived as well, but then they're most likely related. So very, 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 very sad story, but hopefully it's got a happy ending and they find some girls to make new wild dogs with. Where there were a lot of elephants as I came out this afternoon in this area. Now, of course, there's not one to be seen, but I'm sure I'll catch up with them. Maybe they've headed towards Treehouse Dam. It's the closest water to where we are. We're sort of halfway between the, the dam cam and the water and Treehouse. So who knows, maybe we'll see Mr. Tingy Nana as well. For those of you who don't know who Tingy Nana is, it's Tingana. Who we were lucky enough to find on the Sunrise Safari. Now, a pride of lions I have spent an inordinate amount of time with was in Kenya, and they are called the Sausage Tree Pride, and James is with them now. They are indeed a pride of lions that Brent spent a lot of time with and uh, did great work with. We are sitting now with one of the lionesses sitting on a termite mount calling, no idea who she's calling. The rest of the group have headed in for the whole pride, in fact, bar the two very smallest youngsters, are off in front of us there. That's where two lionesses and the two larger youngsters are sitting. There's Kinky Tail. I wonder if there's perhaps a little hole in the ground where they're having a bit of a drink, maybe. And then the original lioness that we found is sitting with her companion just kind of in the distance there, about 500 feet away. There they are. And all around them the herds remain, seemingly oblivious. 
Now, Bungay has just very cleverly said that he thinks this lioness who's closest to us and the one who's calling is quite possibly the mother of the very two or the very small two cubs. But if they're down in that gully where we were, I mean, I can't see them hearing her calling from there. And she's trying to coordinate some sort of hunt. Now, the sausage tree pride is probably going to hunt as it gets a little bit darker. And of course, with the darkness comes many terrors, hyenas, and for these herds, they just don't know what's about to come out of the darkness. As the GOT cliche goes, the night is dark and full of terrors. In this case, a terror of sausages. Imagine, if you will, walking through the pitch darkness of a Mara night. Clouds cover what little light the stars could give. A wind comes up, rustling the grass, making it impossible to hear anything. You know that somewhere around here, the sausage tree pride lives and stalks. Now imagine that you're injured and sick, unable to run. Suddenly, eyes reflect in the darkness, their beam casts straight at you. What do you do? Well, obviously, the first thing is utter a vicious profanity. But then what? Lie down and accept your fate? Or somehow, fueled by adrenaline, find the reserves to overcome the pain and survive? Even if it is just for a little while longer. So an utterly remarkable clip there of a hyena seemingly on its last two legs. It was genuinely on its knees at one stage, somehow managing to explode to life. And I've no doubt it was left alone because it bit those lions. It bit all of these lions who tried to attack it. And they decided it was probably easier to just let her go or let him go. I'm not sure which what it was, male or female. But I did very much feel, as I was writing the voiceover for that little clip, I would thought to myself how incredibly terrifying it must be as an animal here in the night, especially when these lions, you know, they move fairly predictably. The sausage tree pride has been around here for a long time now. And as a human being, obviously, we're able to predict where they'll be, but I guess these animals kind of forget, I'm not sure. So to walk around here knowing that the sausage tree pride is in the area as darkness falls and your eyes are no longer able to see must be just horrendous. Thankfully we have a car. We won't be walking anywhere tonight. Even if the car breaks down, we'll just stay in the car. We have tea. No, TH, I've got no idea what happened to that hyena, I'm afraid. Absolutely no idea whatsoever. And what's interesting is that Steve was in the sighting. Steve was actually presenting it. And he said that that hyena bit at least five or... At least, not five or six lions, but bit lions at least five or six times. And that's why they let it go. And obviously we showed you the kind of shortened version of it all, but it went on for a little while. And eventually, they just left her, or him. But I can't see that hyena surviving for long. I mean, to be walking on its knees like that is very odd. Very indicative of a serious injury. Now, it's fascinating here as well, of course, because, I mean, I know I haven't been in the Mara for a long time, but I have been watching what's going on with Brent. And... Quite interestingly, the pride, I think, has birthed at least two cubs that belong to Kipuli, as far as I can work out. But there are two other males here. Now, whether those two Aldonio Payek males fathered the youngsters, the very small youngsters, I don't know, or whether they've just been conned into believing that they did father them, I'm not sure. But the fact that there are 
are Kipuli's offspring in this pride with the Eldonial Pikes is absolutely amazing. There are the rest of them now. The reason we're kind of so far away from them is that I'm trying to keep an eye on everything going on here. Now Roshni, they have settled slightly since the migration supposedly left town, but I say that, there are tens of thousands of wildebeest on the hills around us, so the lion dynamics probably won't settle just yet, they'll probably unsettle again. And as far as I can work out, they now live quite a long way south of where they did when Brent first started following them at the beginning of this year. Now that little piece of behaviour onto the termite mound to the left tells me that she's scoping for perhaps a little bit of a hunt. But I might be entirely wrong. It's very difficult to figure out what's going on here and because they're spread over such a wide area it's very difficult to know who to follow. We'll probably stick with that lot there and see if they don't try and hunt. They were certainly showing some intent a little bit earlier. Alrighty, we'll get a little bit closer to them while Jamie talks about a hyena called Hart. So, from the sausage tree pride all the way down to South Africa, where there is a very special hyena by the name of Hart. Now, Hart's name is going to be a tricky one to explain, but for those of you that are experts in hyena identification, we'll give it a go and we'll try and see whether or not you can spot the heart because her heart is actually in the negative space between the spots. I haven't drawn it on the diagram because it was far too complicated and I'm not that accurate. Right, without any further ado, once again, meet Hart, one of my absolute favorites. The reason that I love Hart is because she was a boisterous little cub back when I first started in 2015 at Safari Live. So she grew up with Bella as well as her brother Sol, Bella of course being Ntumbela, the son of Madam. And she grew up as a very boisterous little cub, not only with those two, but with June as well. So we'll talk a little bit about June as well. Now, Hart, once upon a time, was one of the most beautiful hyenas that you ever did see. A rich reddish colour and very, very spotty. But now, this is the most identifiable feature of Hart there. That notch out of her right ear, it is perfectly, perfectly square. I love it. It is my favorite ear notch. I don't think I've ever seen a, such a geometrically shaped notch out of an ear in my entire life. So that is uh, the lovely heart. I don't know how she got her ear notch, but she, an ear notch she has. Isn't she lovely? So I tried to draw heart. Heart is a really, really difficult one to try and identify the really clear spots. So this is the, the diagram that I've drawn for heart. So she has a sort of the same, especially on her right hand side, which is of course over there, she has a very similar squarish pattern, sort of circle square. Does that make sense? What's a circle square? A circle square. She's got a circle square in the same way that her mother Gwen had along with some little dots in the middle and a sort of a shark jaw on her bottom. I know what I mean. It does look like a shark bite. Like It looks like the graphic of a shark bite. And then her right hand side, her shoulder, I mean her left hand side, sorry, I'm confusing my lefts and my rights. Her shoulder has sort of a, I don't know what I describe it. Look, it has six spots and they look like that. Six spots, they look like that, and that's what her side looks like. Take a screenshot, compare it, and, and marvel at my accuracy. I counted the spots and everything. Do you know how hard this was to do? It is surprisingly, surprisingly difficult. Now, heart is the example. Oh, there's her ear notch, by the way. That's the most important part. You won't be able to... The reason that we teach you the, the spot patterns is because ear notches change. Sometimes the hyena has an ear notch, the next day it's got no ear. 
I mean, hopefully that doesn't happen, but it does, you know, it's been known to happen. So the end result is that you suddenly look at a hyena that you've never seen before, but you do in fact know. And spot patterns are very important even when you have a notch in an ear. But for those of you that are budding hyena enthusiasts, that will be a very easy way to identify a chunk, chunk, chunk out of her right ear. Now, Hart is a really nice example of a hyena with an astounding personality. She's low ranked in theory. In theory, she's a low-ranked individual. She's still incredibly playful. She's the daughter of Gwen, who unfortunately is now deceased. She died sometime last year. She just vanished, leaving two tiny cubs, or leaving tiny, uh, abandoning a cub, essentially, within a den site. So she disappeared, presumed dead. We knew she was ancient, so it was only a matter of time, really. But her mother had uh, went through this sort of stage where she was bullied by everyone, so was Hart, because she was the daughter of this poor low-ranked female, and it didn't stop Hart. She absolutely loves life. That was her dashing madly backwards and forwards at the very start of the clip when we started our Safari Lives episode. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to. I was mid cough, and then I had a question from Miss Anom, who would like to know whether or not it's true that low ranked females don't produce as much milk as high ranked females. There's not a massive difference, but yes, to a certain degree, there, there will be a difference in the milk production as well as the lactation period. So, uh, spotted hyenas lactate for an extended period of time. Obviously, the higher ranked the individual is, Generally speaking, the more access they will have to resources, the better quality milk they will produce. That is why scientists believe, or biologists believe, that hyenas have evolved with such high levels of male hormones. That's the females, of course. The males have their own male hormones. That makes sense. But the females have such high level of male hormones because it makes them big, strong, able to access resources, and therefore able to produce the best quality milk. And they do. They have the most nutritious milk of any animal out here, any mammal out here. They're the only things that produce milk anyway, so that's fine. Any mammal out here. It's the big mother theory. So yes, to a point, low-ranked females won't produce as good quality milk. There's not a big difference, though. The big difference comes with when the cubs graduate from the den site, which they do before they are weaned completely. Around about eight months or so old, they'll start to go with the adults. For the low-ranked females, they cannot bring food back to the den. So they have to take their cubs with them to go and supplement the feed that they're getting or the food that they're getting. They can't just live on milk at eight months old. They're big. I mean, an eight-month-old hyena is about this big and very, very fluffy. That's, imagine an eight-month-old hyena standing next to me. Very big, very fluffy. It needs meat as well. High-ranked mothers can bring food back to the den and they, they can guarantee their cubs will get it. Low-ranked can't. So they take their cubs to the kills at an earlier age. So the low-ranked cubs actually graduate sooner than the high-ranked individuals. As a general rule, you've got to be so careful with hyenas. They are so, so complex. <coughs> A bright night, you want to know if the higher testosterone levels will produce more male cubs. Not necessarily, no. Um, as far as I know, there's some, there is some connection. I'm trying to remember exactly how it works. There's some connection between the, the hormone levels and the hormone levels in the cubs. But what you will find is that high-ranked individuals will provide their cubs in u when they're in utero, when they're still fetuses, with really, really high levels of hormones that provide that little extra level of aggression. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get males or females. So obviously the sex is determined upon mating. And as far as I know it works, I must double check this, so I, I might be wrong, but as far as I know it works in the same way as humans, that the, the chromosome, the male chromosome comes from the male but I have to double check that. I'm not 100% sure. But yes, the female's hormones, if she's high ranked, will affect the cub in some way, bigger, stronger, more aggressive from the moment that they are born. And they are, of course, born with fully erupted teeth, eyes wide open, and ready to battle with their sibling for the best access to mom's prime suckling position, which is right up against her belly, safe and tucked away, 
with the low-ranked cub that is then bullied a little bit will then lie on the outside. So I must double check exactly what the hormone levels do because obviously I, I mentioned the connection between low ranked females and the fact that they have more males, which makes sense because what's the point of having males or what's the point of having cubs that are just going to perpetuate, be per, perpetually be stuck in a low ranked position? Better to have males that will go off in search for better opportunities. Speaking of a male that is in search of better opportunities, that sounds terrible. Let's go and see what animal Brent has found for you. Well, our second big dominant male leopard of the day. After Kojima, I decided to come and have a squiz to see if we could catch up with the Duke of Juma. We had him this morning not far from here. And right on time, on clockwork, I just said to Seb, he's probably gone to Treehouse Dam for a drink. And we found him drinking a Treehouse Dam. All right, big boy. Are you going to go harass Hasana? Heading in the general direction, from here his favorite route is to head towards uh, quarantine. Okay, well, that's, we're too far below him at the moment, aren't we, Sebastian? It's an interesting view, yes. Not often we're that far below a leopard, unless it's in a tree. Okay. Well, oh, lots of leopards. Three different boys this afternoon. Not something you get every day. I've got an idea, Sebastian. I've got an idea. Are you ready for this? Is everyone ready? This is going to be epic. Let me drive along the little shoulder. We're going to sit eye level with him in this beautiful light. Look at that. I'm going to reverse with him, Seb. If I can get into low range fast enough. Oopsie. How's that? We're moving alongside Tingana. And he's right at our eye level. Yeah, yeah like a dolly shot. For those of you who don't know what a dolly shot is, a dolly is a, a thing that they use in the film industry that carries on a Hey big boy, where are we off to? Oh, he's in a scent mark right next to us. <laughs> there. He is definitely one of the most vocal male leopards I've ever come across in terms of the fact that he vocalizes. I mean, the other day we was, I was chatting to Tristan at Ingers and it must have been what, 11.30, 12 o'clock? And it wasn't a cold day or anything. All of a sudden, just, whoopsie, just below, Tingana starts calling in the middle of the day. He's a very vocal kitty. And that's why when he goes quiet, like he has been for the last few days, we're almost certain he's on a kill somewhere. Miguel says, is he slightly limping? Uh, not that I noticed, but possible. Most of these big cats are. No, I don't think he's limping. No, he's not limping. But uh, Tingana, the one thing I do enjoy about him is he is a cat of habit. From Treehouse, he gets onto this big path and it goes very close to the hyena den. And that's his route. That's his, his vibe. And I'm pretty sure, I wonder if Asana lifted his head when Tingana started calling. 
Isabella says the more vocal, the more dominant. Uh, yes and no. I think it's an it's an area thing as well, and up, uh, an individual leopard thing. So Imvula, the last dominant male in this area, was vocal, but generally at night. Most male leopards I've spent time with over the years are vocal at night. It's very seldom you have them sawing throughout the day. Or even even this this early in the in the in the in the afternoon. Normally, as the sun's a little bit lower, is when they will start vocalizing. And just get you guys into a good spot, and you should walk straight towards us now. There he comes down his favorite path. He is a kitty of habit, I tell you that. Big boy. right next to Sebastian there, just as we were hoping. Underneath Sebastian's bottom. Now, oh, now yeah, the dwarf mongooses have spotted him. Gee! Now, if you compare this to Gajima, who we saw right at the beginning of drive, slinking away very nervously from us, it's like a completely different cat. And Tingana actually means shy. And when he first arrived in the area, he was quite shy, but you can see if you habituate a leopard properly, he becomes like this. And you're able to follow them very easily. Some male leopards, however, just never quite get habituated though. Oh, Tingana, one of your best friends is up ahead, or should I say one of Jamie's friends? Maybe you guys can identify it for me. See there, the hyena. Straight ahead. And I think that hyena woke up due to the sawing of the duke. Who is that? Anyone know who that is? Hashtag Safari Live if you do. Tingana hasn't spotted him yet. Or her. Now he has. Look at him go down trying to hide from the hyena. Yes, and after Jamie's been giving you lessons, I've skipped out on my Jamie hyena lessons, so I should know, but I don't. But maybe you guys will know after Jamie's been giving you lessons on the IDs of these hyenas. Here's he now. There you go. Fatty. There's a notch out. Is that pretty? Well, that square notch. I think it might be pretty. Left ear or right ear? I can't remember which one. Yeah, as I said, as soon as I saw that very square notch out of her left ear, I was like, oh, it's pretty. Don't worry, Tingy, she's not as pretty as you. Seb, yeah. just come out from him onto this tree here, this dead tree. Uh, come out. Look, in, no, right, right, sorry. Oh, I think it's In there. Uh, there, just to the left, there's a little dwarf mongoose shouting at him. Pee! Pee! Okay, I'm going to keep up with him as he moves. Oh, I better tell everyone else I found him on the game drive. Oh, my game drive channel's right now. The stations I've located Tingana. He is mobile to the north in the block between Treehouse Dam and Weaver's Nest Road. Make your way. Okay, he loves to go sit on that termite mound, so I might go wait over there. In the meantime, let's send you to Sydney and Hosanna. 
So I am here now still with Wasana, who is now changing the sleeping positions all the time. Look now, he looks very tired and he's enjoying his sleep. <laughs> this cat is becoming so funny these days. Look at that. So this is an awesome uh, photo. Thank you very much, Craig. So you can see that he, he is on a deep sleep at the moment. So earlier this week, I was somewhere by the Torchwood area where Talamba, the little princess, was left alone by Tandy, showing some of her abilities to do hunting. Tandy left the little princess to fend for herself this week. She has had nothing but her own skills to keep her alive. She did not look thin, although her lack of experience made hunting large prey difficult. Talambo was still able to feed herself. Her mother, the queen, is leaving her alone for longer and longer periods. She is probably missing the large meal provided by Tandy, but she must learn to hunt large prey. Her stomach was finally satisfied by an impala eel. We are not sure if she managed to kill it or if she found it dead. Only the little princess knows. She didn't make much of a dent in the kill and easily became distracted. She was unable to hoist the heavyweight dinner, so a hyena stole it, but at least Kalamba's stomach was satisfied. A one-year-old little princess was showing us her ability to do the hunting, so that was lovely. Imagine being left alone for about two or three days without anybody to look after you. So I am sure Tandy deliberately did that in order to give Kalama a little bit of chance to start looking after herself as she's just left with a few months to become independent. In a year's time, Kalamba is going to be independent. So these cats, they do go through a very difficult, vulnerable stage from when they are hidden by the den alone mother goes long distances and come back looking for food uh, other animals predators such as hyenas and wild dogs can easily attack them but i can promise you now kalamba she is climbing very big trees and she's talking i don't think the predators will be able to get hold of her at the moment and i've seen while we're still very young tandy has been leaving uh, kalamba unattended for quite a lot of times. Uh, Jennifer, I haven't seen Tandy for quite a long time, but I heard by some of the guys, Tandy has just been spotted around Torchwood area. She is around here. Leaving behind a little princess is normal to the lepers. When they're growing, they have to do that so that they can equip their little ones with the good skills of survival. So you can see that here we have got also uh, the little chief who also grew up without the mother. The mother passed away when the little chief was still very young. But look at him today. Here is he. He's growing. He can be able to hunt and do all these things. I'm sure uh, uh, Hosanna has been doing hunting from a very young stage. Because growing without a mother close by and growing with a mother is not the same. We don't get the same experience. <laughs> this cat is going to get his own.
going to be three years by next year, February. And when it's three years, from three years to four years, because normally the leopards, they do start to establish their own territory when they are about four years and above. But the thing is, the areas already here has been demarcated. Which side are you going to take uh, Hosanna? That is a very big question to me as well, because this cat is not like he's going to, de to demarcate his area without female. He must first try to get hold of some of the females in order to have access for mating activities. So he must have to demarcate an area which will overlap to one of the females. Who is going to allow that? So I think the best way is to gain more strength and fight and win the territory so that the females who are around there, automatically, they might be interested on a very brave, brave leopard. So now uh, let's go to Jenny and hear more again about the hyenas. More about the hyenas indeed, and those of you who've been watching closely and know our hyenas really, really well, well, you might have guessed who is the final hyena on our list. A hyena that I have a very, very soft spot for. It is not this hyena. That would be macabre. Very macabre. Right. Now, let's see. It's now a challenge. I don't think this is, this is probably not in sort of Meg's timetable for this afternoon, but she's going to have to put up with it. Oh dear, Dave. There's a roof, Dave. I could do it. I could do it. We thought we'd get inventive and hold the jaws open, but I fear it might have been a terrible mistake. Right. Well done. Thank you. And for my next act, I present you with June, the hyena. <laughs> Look at this. Look at how tiny June was when I first started working here in 2015. I absolutely adored this little munchkin. Look, look how nervous she is. Oh, all wrinkled and submissive. Daughter of Scarback, the hyena, who unfortunately is also deceased. Her first tentative steps away from the entrance to the den into the boisterous company of Bella as well as Heart and Soul. And then playing with some of the older cubs. This is June now. Okay, and stop. Right. This is the best hyena out of all of them for a spot pattern. Not everyone can see it. So certain people really, really struggle with June's spot pattern. June has the word juice written on her side. Now, if you can't see it, that's okay. That's why I wanted to stop now and show you. So juice, this is the, this is the J, the U, the I, the C, and the E sort of goes bloop across her shoulder. So juice, can you sort of see it there in those spots? So June also has a J on her left side, but June, her spots are very, very indistinct at times and she seems to quite like rolling in the dirt. So now that she's an adult, it's really hard to see. I like the arrow on her shoulder though, I drew that out for you as well, because it's quite clear. Right, most important though, so you can memorize her left side, but most important is look for the word juice. We're about to show you her right-hand side again. Now, look, see if you can see it. On the hyena on the left, there's the J. There's the J towards her hip. Megs can see it. J-U-I-C-E, juice. And the more she moves around, the more you see it and the more you can't unsee it. We, should, we might have to change her name, you know. I'm joking, nobody panic. I think I'm the one who named June. I went through a stage where I just named them all. I just named them all after months. It, it, got, it was so complicated and I needed a way of keeping track of the cubs and I went, okay, that one's called June. And then, because she was born roughly in June and then I said, okay, that one's November and that one, oh, we've got two Decembers, so we've got D1 and D2. 
I'm sorry. I provided some seriously uncomfortable names now that we've sort of three years down the line and June is now three and a half years old and for all we know could end up having a cub in the month of June next year. In fact, I suspect there's a possibility she's already been pregnant once. Of course, with Litter's first-time mothers and hyenas, it's very difficult for them to give birth. Anyway, enough about that. Let's finish off with June. So there we go. There's June on the left. The word juice is clear as day to certain people. And this is June now showing an interest in Pretty's Cubs this year. Clearly feeling the stirrings of a maternal instinct. Very clean ears, so you can't really use her ears to identify. Look, look, juice! <laughs> okay, that's a bit of an awkward angle. I can see the word juice. It's there, I promise you, the word juice is there. <laughs> and uh, the more you watch her, the more you'll see the word juice. Ju juice, I mean June. <laughs> Here's her left side. Her left side's almost impossible. I find her left side very difficult because she just never actually shows it. So there you go, our final female of the day, the one and only June. I have a soft spot for Hart and June because they were the cubs that were cubs when I first arrived here. And I've watched them sort of grow up. I've missed out on a lot of their their growing up phase. But I do have a soft spot for them, especially because they both recently lost their mothers. So they really are almost entirely alone in this clan. Now, I don't know the connection between Scarback and Gwen don't necessarily think that there is one but those are their two mothers and the two of them together are around about the same age both reaching the point where they're going to be first-time mums i know that Hart has been pregnant in the past she was seen lactating we don't know what happened to those cubs sometimes low-ranked females go off and they den on their own but it's a risk because to take those cubs that far away from the rest of the clan if those cubs grow up and the clan members have never met them before, there's a possibility that they will not be greeted with kindness because they're just not known. There's a reason that hyenas go to communal dens, even low rankers like Scarback and Gwen. Apart from that one time that Gwen didn't den with the rest of the clan, which I think was because of that massive fight that they had, not that long before that. But otherwise, they, the, the low-ranked females will bring their cubs to the communal den because the, the other den members have to know, the other clan members have to know that they've got these cubs. They have to get to know them by smell and by sight because each and every single hyena knows each and every single hyena clan member. And if they can do it, so can you. <laughs> well, you can start. How about that? Jenica, my hyena's lost a tooth. Um, Jenica wants to know when a hyena like Corky will, will stop. Oh dear, oh dear. Okay, I'm going to stop touching that. Well, <laughs> looks more intimidating without a tooth anyway. And it fits with our story of age. When will a matriarch like Corky stop ruling the clan? Sometimes what happens is they get to the point where they're sort of 12, 13, 14 years old. And they really actually don't want to be dominant anymore. I think they're just getting too old. Where they actually show support for a certain female to step up and take their place. And the younger females start to dominate them a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Until eventually they fade into obscurity. But when that will happen, no one knows. The reflexes are just slightly slower on uh, an older female. We saw it, we, honestly, we saw it with Corky. She did stand her ground at the den, but only for a split second, and then she ran, but she did admittedly run into a giant fallen tree, and that's why the lion caught her. And mistakes like that, in that case she was very lucky, but mistakes like that cost an animal its life. And you saw how James's hyena really, really fought for it, even though it was desperately injured. But if those lions had meant to, they were really serious about that. Or if they'd had a male with it, that would have been it. That would have been it for that hyena. And the same would have applied for Corky if she hadn't fought back as hard as she did. She even grabbed him by the lip at one point and sort of pulled it aside. It's so cool if you watch it very slowly. And that brings us to the conclusion. That's a failed one. We'll put that over there. That brings us to the conclusion of all five... Hyena females, not counting in Tima because she's not quite there yet. Artie. How's that? That combined with one tooth. My collection of spots, I hope it made sense to you. 
and one tooth. Right, <laughs> we, we have a lot more to keep track of when it comes to spot patterns. At least our leopards keep things relatively simple. That they do. And Mr T has decided it's quite warm and he's going to have a little schnooze here in the Philemon's dip drainage system before he carries on. Now, the distance between him and Asana now is probably a kilometre. So, it's a good chance that... Or, Hassan's definitely heard him calling. Whether he comes to investigate or not, who knows? Look at Port. His ears are starting to get very tattered, especially the left one. And see, there's quite a big, strange shape out of that bottom part of his left ear. And you can see all the damage caused by the biting flies. Look, you can even see there's two of those little biting flies on his ears. Those are called stable flies. They're the same species of fly that attacks your dogs and cats and horses, and oh, that's where they get their name from, the stable fly. He is getting on, Mr. T, but he is in immaculate condition at the moment. And here, go, great go away, bird. I spotted him. Those of you who are avid damn cam viewers, keep an eye out tonight. I think he might make an appearance. It has been quite warm today. He might make a, a, an appearance on the damn cam later this evening. Quite hot, breathing quite heavily, he is moved about a kilometer or so from since we found him and walking quite steadily apart from his little hiding from the hyena game we're not we're not far from the hyena den probably 200 meters from the hyena den well it's been wonderful having you on this episode of safari lives and let's send you back to Jamie to wrap it all up with some more hyena info. And what a spectacular week it has been. A truly, truly special week, as it always is, with the various beloved members of our hyena clan. This could not possibly go wrong. I'm just going to keep focusing on the camera. Fortunately, I've got a fair amount of time before the end of the safari so I can walk really slowly. Now, to finish off our hyena chat, Laurie would like to know a little bit about whether or not there's research here. I have to look down, but I can't tilt my head because otherwise I'm going to trip over a bone. Boys. Boys and bones. Now, Laurie would like to know a little bit about whether or not there's any research being done here on Juma Private Game Reserve, as opposed in the similar way that there is in the Mara. Not that I'm aware of, Laurie, so I don't think there's any research programs here. That's not because people aren't interested in the hyenas here, it just so happens that there aren't any scientists studying them. So it just so happens there's a gap, there's an opening. There's certain people who know what I'm talking about. If you want to come out and research the hyenas of at least the low felt, I think there's plenty of opportunity. Not only that, I can't do this anymore. Not only that, I, I talk too much with my hands. I move. I move too much. Drives the cameraman mad, but I cannot stand still and upright the entire time. Not only that, but there is a vast amount of behavioral differences between the hyenas in the Maasai Mara as well as the hyenas on Juma. So whether it's Juma or whether it's the low felt, there's a vast amount that we could actually learn about the hyenas of Juma. Now what we're doing is piecemeal, to say the least. We don't always go to the den. 
I kind of always do, but I'm not always on drive. We don't always go to the hyena den. We miss out on so much. We don't follow them constantly in the same way that we did in the Mara. And I think that there's a vast amount that we miss out on as a result. Who knows what actually happened during the last few months? What resulted in the death of all those older females? How Madame died? Who's up next? What exactly is playing out? Did Hart ever have her cubs? Or at least where did she put them? Will June have cubs soon? Hopefully soon. Got a feeling it's going to be soon. These are all questions that we hope to answer, but might just take a little bit more time. Now, it's been really special sharing this with all of you. Carla, you say it was interesting, and thanks for showing you the drawings. I hope they made sense. I did put a fair amount of time into them, and it was really quite complicated to try and do. But I'm trying to get more people into hyenas because I'm obsessed with them, and there's a few out there who are equally obsessed. And they're fascinating animals, and they deserve just as much attention as our lions and our leopards. That doesn't mean that we miss out on attending to our lions and our leopard characters. So we love Tingana, we love Hosanna, we love the Sausage Tree Pride, we love Tandi and Tlalamba, and we will still watch them each and every single day. And thus we draw to the end of our 23rd episode of Safari Lives. Can you believe it? The year has flown by. We'll be back again tomorrow with the regular safari. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you had fun, and we'll see you then.